about this that um, somebody can get a prophetic word to preach a month in advance a year in advance it doesn't have to be spontaneous sometimes God can speak now for a word that you're going to share later and uh, I, this is a word that God dropped in my heart I think it's for right now for Hope Church and so I'm going to dive into this we talked last night uh, about being prepared being a people prepared for the Lord and if you, if you were here last night and you liked it, say amen or something. Amen. <laughs> okay, thanks for faking that. That's awesome. And then, no, it was, a, it was a great time last night and talked about John the Baptist and his life message was uh, about preparing, getting ready for what God is about to do. And I want to dive into that just a little bit more uh, tonight. In Hosea chapter 10, there is a scripture that I want to preach to you from and uh, you can pop it open on your on your um, phone or if you have a, a paper Bible or whatever, and we're going to just have that there. And this is what it says. So for yourselves, righteousness. And he's talking not about making clothing, but about putting seeds in the ground when he's saying so. So for yourselves, righteousness, and you'll reap steadfast love. <clears throat> Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. Amen to God's word. Amen. It's uh, my habit to just pray and ask. It's an ancient prayer that churches have prayed for thousands of years and so, to say, uh, come Holy Spirit, when we preach the word of God. So would you lift your hands open to the Lord? Jesus, we come and so grateful for your presence here. And God, I just pray for your help and anointing tonight. And we say, come Holy Spirit, touch our hearts and make us more like you. Let us hear the word of the Lord for us individually tonight and how we should respond to you, Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. We get ready to uh, present something or, you know, like when, uh, how many of you have ever had kids that had a presentation at school? Anybody had a kid that had to get, I know that you, you giggle and lift your hand because you did that presentation the night before. So I remember doing the science volcano, you know, you put the powder in, you pour the, the vinegar in and it and looks all cool uh, but my sons didn't tell us until the night before like hey it's 10 o'clock I know it's way past bedtime but I've got a project tomorrow and uh, so that happened you know sometimes in our life but the reason that we prepare anything is not just to get prepared but it's to present something so you prepare so that you can present something and so we want to prepare our hearts for the Lord in this season, especially right here in Hope Church, we want to get prepared by being with the Lord, not just having 21 days of prayer and fasting. Come on, having a daily life of prayer and fasting as God leads scripture. Come on, we want to be prepared for the Lord so that when he shows up, he goes, what do you got? You can say, I want to present this. Lord, I'm ready and here I am. And so we, we do that. I uh, had a very good example of this idea of getting prepared. Uh, my friend and I were youth pastors in the Portland and Vancouver area. And in 2009, we both felt a calling to start and plant a church. And at that time, they did not have some of these church planning organizations that are available now. There was not a lot of curriculum. And uh, there's a group called ARC. They were just getting started. Uh, I didn't know about it. My friend says, hey, I found out about a church planners boot camp." He says, do you wanna go? I said, yes. I said, what is that? And he said, we go for four and a half days to California and we just get trained by guys that have church planted and they tell you what to do and the game plan. And I'm like, I'm in, we're gonna go. Well, my friend had signed up like two months ago or two months earlier and we only had like a couple weeks, got on the phone, got on the website. They called, they wanted to do a phone interview. They wanted us to fill out paperwork, our history, our background, books we'd read, what's our influences, what's the vision. You needed to have a vision statement for your church all these things to get ready. And, and one of the things that they said is when you show up at, at some random point, you will be called upon to give one of two sermons. Both sermons can only be 10 minutes long. 
And uh, one of the sermons will be a regular Sunday sermon for you. The other one would be a 10-minute sermon that would be a shortened version of what you would preach opening Sunday. It needs to include the gospel and an altar call for people to give their lives to Jesus. And so I'm like scrambling, you know, I'm like, okay. And my heart was to see lost people won to Jesus in our new church plant. So that I was like, okay, I'll get that one ready. We get to the uh, boot camp and we get into a room and there's, we're there and there's probably, uh, I don't know, 20 couples or something like that. So maybe like, you know, this middle section of people and they have us in a room and they're going through an orientation, what the week's going to be like. And then they go like this, Johnny, come on up here. And he's like, what? Like, you're going to do your sermon. One of your sermons. And he goes, uh, I, right now, I, I need, I need a, where's Jess? You know, like, and uh, he goes, I'm not ready. And they go, your time starts now. When you hear the bullhorn, you must stop. Do not go past the blowhorn. And he stuttered, and he's like, uh. And then he came on up, and he started rambling and made no sense. And I thought, oh, dear Jesus, we're all going to die. You know, it was, it was this awkward moment. I was, I think, one of the next guys, and they go, all right, you, and they're looking at our name tags, Matt, come on up here. And I thought, here we go. And I got up there, and I just thought, I'm not going to do what Johnny did. And I was like, as I've been praying for this moment for the last two years, you know, and I began to preach a simple sermon, shared the gospel, invited people to start following Christ, and then the blow horn went off, and that day, you guys, four church planters gave their hearts to Jesus. No, I'm just, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. They were, <laughs> but I was able to, I was able to do it. And part of that was because I had spent a little bit of time preparing. And it's interesting because oftentimes when, when God gets you prepared for something, you, you don't know how many training sessions you're going to have. You don't know when he's going to put you in the race. So you just got to get on that treadmill right now because he'll call your number. And come on, you got to be prepared. Are you with me on that? So being prepared is part of what God wants to do for us. And you got to prepare whether it's a puppet show or preaching time. Come on. All right. There's a theme in scripture about being prepared, getting yourself ready, consecrating yourself. Uh, I found out after the fact, pastor preached about Joshua prepare yourself, consecrate yourself, because in the next days, in the next moments, we're starting a new season. And so this is really a word for your church. The, the theme of this goes all the way through the Bible from uh, Exodus was one of the first places I saw it. it goes all the way through scripture. I'm not going to go through all those scriptures, but in Revelation 19, right at the end of the Bible, it says this, let, the, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and the bride, which is you and me, the bride has made herself ready. Now listen, if we're going to be people who are going to get ourselves ready and prepare ourselves, it's because this is a part of the ultimate purpose of God. It says, so we can be with him forever, a bride without spot or wrinkle. Come on. He's getting his people ready, a people prepared for the Lord. So that's why we get holy. That's why we deal with sin in our life. That's why we go to church. That's why we read scripture. That's why we on Friday night, instead of I thought all Montanas were hunting or going to football games, but you're in church because come on, you're preparing something in your soul so you can be ready to present yourself to the Lord. Getting prepared is part of our ultimate purpose. So I came across this scripture in Hosea and uh, that I read to you at the beginning. I want to read a little bit more context of it. And so you see the agricultural framework that this is drawing upon. And I didn't even know all these terms. I love the city. And I was in, we were out to lunch today with uh, your pastors, and, and Pastor Lance says, Matt, do you like camping? And I said, I really can appreciate people who do that. You know, like <laughs> my, favorite, my favorite camping, per personal piece of camping gear is a hotel room. So, like, I'm not, a, you know... Okay, Ephraim, here's, here's the context in Hosea. Ephraim was a trained calf that loved to thresh. I spared her fair neck, but I will put Ephraim to the yoke. Judah must plow. Jacob must harrow for himself. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap 
steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. This scripture is a preparation scripture. It is the Lord saying, there are some things that need some work in your life, and I'm not done with you, or I would have killed you. And so I'm giving you a chance to prepare your life like a farmer prepares the land and you need to do the hard work and get it ready so that my enduring love can come into your life and so that my righteousness can rain down on you and you won't it, it won't even be your own righteousness you will train yourself in righteousness so but then the righteousness of Christ will literally just rain on your life it is a preparation word. It is a, right now because the Lord says it is about time for rain. Okay, so in agriculture, fallow ground, I, I uh, began to research this. When I, when I grew up, I went to church my, almost my whole life. In fact, I went to church my whole life. I just don't remember all of it. But I went to church my whole life, and I've heard this verse preached before. Raise your hand if you've been in church and heard that verse before. Would you just raise your hand? Break up your fallow ground. A lot of you have. I, I uh, always heard it preached in, in this basic framework. Repent so you don't burn in hell. <laughs> Break up your hard heart. Get, get it soft for Jesus. And there's some of that, I suppose, in Hosea. But I think there's a little bit something softer, a little bit different that's contained in this call of God to call his people individually into a place of preparation because he wants to be with them. And it's really cool. So fallow ground means this. It's ground that has been left unfarmed for a long period of time usually a season is how long a piece of ground is left fallow it's not been plowed or planted or harvested and it rests and fallow was uh, planned for it was a rest for the ground that actually if you took a field and you rested it and you had another field exact same crops and you didn't rest this one this year it rests but in the second year when you plowed the fallow ground and then planted it the harvest is much greater here than the same one next to it because when ground is allowed to rest the nutrients aren't depleted out of it and phosphorus and nitrogen and uh, iron and all the different things begin to come back up from the deep deep places of the ground and to re-strengthen the dirt for its purpose it's an interesting thing that God would call us to to have some fallow ground in Leviticus chapter 25 it says this but the in the seventh year shall be a sabbath rest to the land a sabbath for the Lord can you imagine like if it, like how, maybe some of you have plants <laughs> like farms or whatever again you know city city boy here but uh, can you imagine that that's your only means of survival and the Lord goes I want you to take one of your fields and I want you to leave it fallow and it's for me that would be a tough tough call to do that he says it's a Sabbath for the Lord you shall neither sow thy field nor prune the vineyard. So this was a, a part of God's plan was to let ground go fallow. Okay, how many of you are with me so far, even though it's weird what I'm talking about? Okay, you, you good? Okay. Fallow ground plowed, left unseated, unseated for a season or more. It's uncultivated. And Israel is instructed by the Lord to let their land go unplowed and unplanted every seventh year but then to come back and do it. Let me just tell you this. I actually, my, my grandpa and my great uncle had farms and I actually did spend quite a bit of time in my summers growing up picking raspberries, shucking corn, baling hay, and you know, with the hooks and putting it up on the truck. I do know a little bit about how hard the farm work is. I'm just not good at it now and I buy stuff at Walmart, but I do know about it. And I will tell you this, if you had a fallow ground on half your land and you had regular ground, when you go next year, you're going to have to work on this ground, even though it was already cultivated and productive last year. You're going to have to come through and pull weeds and come on, get it ready. But if you go to this ground, this ground is going to be harder to get ready 
than this ground that was already fruitful. And this is the power of like, we, we talked a little bit about routines last night and the things in our life that are already fruitful are great and we can just keep going. Whether it's like, hey, I, I believe in tithing. I started sowing 10% of my income into the house of the Lord. I started being generous above and beyond that. I started doing it. It gets easy, but it still needs work once in a while. But if there's another area of your life like serving in kids ministry and you go, oh, that's, that's fallow ground. I don't know if I can do that anymore. That ground, that ground is like clean laid over it's always harder to break up fallow ground it's always easier to go back to what we know okay that's what I'm trying to say here break up your fallow ground so farming work come on is some of the hardest work I think um, I think farmers are having like a comeback in, in America like it's a big deal right now like all the NFL games it's like farmer wants a wife come on somebody have you seen those commercials there's like farmerswiperight.com or whatever. Like there's apps and there's, you know, it's people. There's, I read a, a real report that millennials can't afford to live in the cities and they're moving out and people are moving into doing, and there's a whole movement of getting back to nature. There are weirders. The weirdest of them are people who are taking off their shoes and they're just standing in the dirt and they're like getting grounded. You know what I mean? Like there's just a whole, but the land and the farming thing is making a comeback. It's hot right now. Come on, if you're sitting next to a farmer, just like pat him on the shoulder and be like, mm, you're hot stuff right now. Come on, you got a good thing going right there. <laughs> okay, I gotta make, this is the point I wanna make tonight. I need everybody in here to become a farmer for a moment, okay, just in your mind, to think about your life as if it were, you were a farmer. And two key words that I wanna talk about. Fields and farms. Y'all with me? Okay, fields and farms. Here's what I'm going to do with that. Fields are parts of your farm. Your farm would be your whole life. Fields would be the different sections of your life. You, you tracking? My grandma and grandpa Molt in Milwaukee, Oregon had sweet malt corn. It was famous in Milwaukee, Oregon. They had raspberries and they had a few other plants, and they had filberts. And uh, some of you are like, filberts. You don't know what filberts are? Hey, anybody ever had, um, what's that, that spread Nutella? Has anybody had Nutella? Thank you, Grandpa Molt, for Nutella. He made filberts. That's what's in Nutella. Come on, somebody give the Lord praise for Nutella, okay, and for farmers. So they had different acres and different plots and different fields within their farm. And your life is like that. In your life as a farmer, you have the field of your life that is your educational life. You have the field in your life that is your social field of your life. You have a health field. You have a part of your life that you go, hey, it's January 1, let's try again. And now it's January 25th. You're like, no, we're good. And, uh, but you, that's a field of your life. You have these sections. You have recreation. You have friendship. You have these portions of of the farm of your life that, represent, that are represented in our little thing here as fields. Are y'all, is this making sense? Okay. And one of those fields in your life is your spiritual life. It's the part of the day that you give to God to not just think about him and turn on like K-Love and yeah, I had moments of intercession. No, you listen to Shout to the Lord again, get a new album. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, it, spiritual life is when you actually read scripture. You actually spend some time praying. You actually serve. You go, God, how are you going to lead me today? Your will be done, not my will be done. It's your spiritual life. Here's what happened in 2020. People moved from our church to Idaho and Montana. <laughs> That's what happened in COVID. Uh, we, you know, I, this is a very non masky kind of state, but uh, happened to live in the great People's Republic of Washington, and in communist Washington, we had to wear masks, and so, it, yeah, I understand, yeah. What happened in 2020 was uh, that it really devastated a lot, a lot of churches around the nation, uh, and it was hard to gather people back together. People got home, and got used to it. I have a guy who was a worship leader for us. He's been back in church like five or six times. And I've tried to stay in contact with him as a friend. And I'm like, man, I said, 
you know, I won't say his name, but I said, where, where are you? And he's like, I just, on, if he goes, if I'm honest, I just got so used to being at home and watching you on video that on Sunday mornings, he goes, I just got like, you know, Fruit Loops and I'm just on my couch in my PJs, you know, you know, amen. And I'm like, man, we need you. Let me just tell you that at the fields of our life, when, when pressure comes and when something disruptive comes in your life, you know what? You only have so much time to give. And if your life is a farm and you go, I, I, I can't get it all done. A kid got sick. I got laid off. This happened. I'm going through relational conflict. There's a thing with my family. I've got aging parents. I've got these different interruptions. When those come into our lives, what we do instinctively is we say, I can't do everything, so I'm going to do these things to survive. And what we do is we stop working all the fields of our life, and we go, and in COVID, we went, I'm going to make sure I got some money. I got toilet paper. I couldn't buy toilet paper because some of the crazies. Listen, there's a difference between being prepared and being a prepper. Like if you have an underground tunnel, you need to get prayer. Don't talk to me after. Talk to pastor. But, you know, so people are like, okay, I got my money. I got my toilet paper. And I want my kids. And, and, and then that became the three fields that we plowed and, and poured into. And it was self-protective. The first field for almost all of us that goes fallow when pressure comes is our spiritual life, our spiritual field. We go, I don't have time to go to church. I can't afford to tithe. I, I don't want to serve. I just need to be in church. I can't, I can't read scripture right now. I just need to watch something funny on Netflix for 14 hours. And look, that part of your life went fallow. It got hardened and unplanted. Now, God made provision. There are seasons. I've been, I'm a really big proponent of praying the Lord's Prayer in my life. I do it every morning. It's a track I run on for prayer. feel like it's important because Jesus said to pray this way. Anyway, no guilt for anybody else. I'm just like, that's my conviction, right? So I pray that prayer. And it's been a life-giving thing for me. And so I have a, a very dedicated morning protocol of giving that to Jesus. It's been going for six years and I haven't, hadn't missed a day in a long, long time. Two years ago in February, uh, my father passed away. He was older and, you know, just a lot of complications physically in his life and he ended up dying. And it was so traumatic to me that I, I remembered I got about a week, maybe two weeks past it with all the chaos, all the family meetings, all the things. I ended up going... Oh my goodness, I haven't prayed in two weeks. And I remember the next morning waking up and I go, and this is just the honest truth. The truth I was like, Jesus, I just can't have a, very, a real conversation with you yet. Like I can't. I, I'm coming back, but I, I can't today. And I felt like Jesus was like, I got you, kid. There are seasons where every part, every field of your life will have a rest. But what happens is, God doesn't let those seasons go into the next season. He says, it is now time to break up your fallow ground because I'm about to rain. And if you don't start, if you don't get back in the game, then you won't be ready for what the harvest that I have planned for you. Here's a couple dangers of letting ground go fallow for too long. One is... If you retreat out of like the eight or nine main areas of your life into two or three, you get self-deceived because you do survive. And you start to go, I don't know if I need all those. Maybe I'll just sell those chunks off to keep these two or three and keep me happy. And people get very insulated and isolated and stop leading worship and start watching from home. And they start going, I'm just going to take care of me. And I'm going to sow into my fields, take care of me. And eventually your world becomes so small. And now when it's been two or three or four years and you go, oh, I had a calling on my life. I was supposed to invest in this. That ground is not just hard, but sprouts and trees and vines are growing where you were supposed to have produce. And now it's not just tough ground. You got to clear Stuff that isn't supposed to be growing in your life. 
that is growing where it wasn't supposed to be. And I'm telling you, it's the mercy of God that calls to us that says, break up your fallow ground. And if there's any part of your life that has been fallow for too long, I just want to call you back to take an honest look at your life. Some people go say stuff like this. Uh, yeah, I'm a little quirky, but you know, God's okay with me. No, maybe you need to figure out some people skills and be kind. <laughs> maybe I, you know, just, I kind of got into this thing and now I'm investing in, if all my investments come, then I'm going to tithe on that. If, if I, and people have these weird excuses for sin and for bad habits. And God, at some point, if you read Hosea, God was angry. But in this moment, he goes, okay, listen. I need you to get this. And I, wanna, I want steadfast love to be in your life. But you've got to do that hard work of breaking up that fallow ground, that part in your life that you didn't want to look at, didn't want to touch, was too painful, but it is time to do it. You'll never be ready. You've got to do it right now. It's time because God's about to do something. He's going to move and you've got to be ready. I just want you to get yourself ready. I had to take an honest look at myself um, in my life in 2019. Um, in 2019, I went to counseling in um, Colorado because it felt like it was far enough away where nobody would know what I was going to say. Like, that's the honest truth. I'm a pastor, and I'm like, I remember going to my elders and going, I don't know what's going on, but I do not feel good. I don't feel normal. And I, I, I you know, I was like, I'm, a, I'm, I'm kind of in, on the inside, I'm kind of a mess. Our church is blowing up. It's growing. We're adding services. And I'm like, but I, I, this is going to crack, and I don't want to be a documentary. And so... I'm like, God, you got to help me. And so my church sent me off to counseling, a week of counseling, not, a, not an hour, a week. I lived there on this. This is true. I lived there for, for a week. And uh, it really was healing for my soul and really helpful. But we had an experience. I don't know what your guys' Thanksgiving to Christmas looks like. I'll tell you what ours is. Day after Thanksgiving, we, we start to put up Christmas decorations. Christmas night, 12.01, Lisa's like, let's take those down right now. Like, she, she's like, let's clear it out and get it put away. So that was in 2023, that was our plan. Uh, in 2022, the Christmas before, um, so in that Christmas, we packed up and we got rid of a lot of Christmas stuff. Went through and we got rid of some of them and, and, and kept some boxes. And, and I just need to tell you, my garage is a mess. My garage is a, it's, it's a normal man garage. Uh, I, what I would consider normal. But it's not orderly. And uh, it's a, a little bit of chaos. So we, we packed the Christmas stuff in there. And then uh, during the course of 2023, as it began, like my mom, uh, after my dad died, my mom gave me this painting that's, it's, for, it's massive. No one should own a painting this big. And it's inside plywood, nailed together. So nobody can even enjoy it, but she didn't have a place for it. So it's in my garage, and it leans up against my Christmas stuff. And then we had a, a remodel on a bathroom happen uh, for us this year. And so the guys that did the tile work and stuff, they're, you know, cutting all the tile, and they left all the extra stuff out of the way, but up against the painting. And then we bring in, I bring in my Traeger and my Blackstone griddle, uh, and get my uh, stuff, you know, for the winter, and I just roll it out of the garage a little bit, but I put it in there, and, and the only place I have room for it is up against the tile. And so then this year, the day after Thanksgiving, Lisa's like, hey, can you go get the Christmas stuff? And I'm like, you have no idea how long it's going to take me to <laughs> climb that mountain and, and pull out those boxes, you know, because there's so much stuff in there. Back to my counseling. I'm in the counseling thing, and I told the counselor, I said, I don't know why I'm here, I don't know. I don't think there's anything really big wrong with me. I don't know what you're going to try to fix, but I don't know. He's like, well, what do you want to talk about? I said, I don't even know. You're the, like, you know, and it was just weird. Didn't even know if I believed in counseling. Guy was apparently a Christian. I don't know if you can be a Christian and a counselor. Like, it just seemed weird, you know, and I'm like, okay. And uh, so he goes, tell me about your life. And so I'm like telling him, and he goes, he's reading through all my intake papers. 
And he's like, you know, you've been through some trauma. You've been through this when you were a kid. And you went through this. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I just, yeah, but, but I got past that. And he's like, what about this? He starts naming, goes through like 10 or 11 things. He finally pulls his glasses down. And he looks at me, he goes, you realize you've had some pretty big deals in your life and you act like it's nothing. And I said, well, yeah, because I'm a man of faith and I just keep moving forward. And he goes, right. He goes, you know what your life is like, Matt? Your life is like a man whose garage is filled with boxes. And every time something horrible happens in your life, you just put it in a, in a moving box. You tape it up real good. You take it out to the garage and you come back out all like, we're good. Let's keep going. Let's keep plowing ahead. Wow. He goes, your garage is about to explode. I was like, you have no idea. <laughs> Gave me some tools to help open and stuff up. Listen, I just, I'm saying all that to say this. Uh, if you want to really get prepared for the Lord, you have some fields that are fine. But you probably have some fields in your life that you've got to have an honest look at. It's hard to look at the pain. It's hard to start something that you haven't worked on for a while. But that's the field that tonight the Lord is asking you to take an honest look at and go, I don't even know where to start. But I'm going to go get an axe and a shovel. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to start this because God's coming. I want to have something to present to him. And what you're presenting is you're presenting your soul to him. You're getting your life healthy again. You're not living in some tiny little circle, but you're getting your soul prepared. So you can say, God, I, I'm ready for whatever part of my life you want to rain down on. Break up your fallow ground so that the Lord can come and rain righteousness upon you. I had, um, I want to end with this. I was reading this morning, I was praying, I was like, God, speak to me for tonight, you know, and um, man, this one weird scripture kept coming to me. And the closer we got to tonight, in fact, it was tonight on the front row, I had to sit down and add it to my notes because it just wasn't making sense. The Lord was highlighting something to me. And it's a story that Jesus tells. It's in Luke 13. He tells a story, a parable. It says a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and he found none. And he says to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree. In 2021, in 2022, in 2023, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up more ground? The vine dresser answers back to the owner, and scripture gives us clues that the vine dresser in Jesus' stories, metaphorically, is Jesus the Messiah. And so Jesus is telling the story about even though the wrath of God that was in Hosea's day, the vine dresser, the one who actually comes and works in the dirt, is in our everyday life, walked on the planet, fully God, fully man. The vine dresser speaks back to God. Oh, you guys, this is so great. Sir, let it alone. This year also, I'll dig around it and I'll put on manure. Amen. Come on, you never thought it was going to be so powerful, right? <laughs> then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. If not, you can cut it down. Listen, you know what, Jesus, his heart is for us. And there's areas of our life that I just have let go. Don't want to work on that. But man... God eventually goes, hey, I'm going to just take that away from you. But Jesus steps in and goes, Father, I've been working on this one. Let me break up the fallow ground around this fig tree. Let me dig in the dirt, put what's needed into the soil, and then come back and see if we get some fruit. Like that, there's, there's a part of breaking a fallow ground that we absolutely have to do ourselves. No getting around it. But there's a part that when we start, when you get out that shovel and you get out that ax and you step onto that place where you go, I don't know where to start, but I'm here. And you start chopping. All of a sudden the vine dresser, 
jumps in invisibly in your life and goes, I'm right behind you, kid. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you. I'm going to loosen those roots. We're going to pull that sucker out. And all of a sudden you get a little clearing and God goes, okay, now you pull it here. And quit toiling here just a second. And God starts to do the heavy lifting. The Holy Spirit in your life starts to uproot some things that have been in your life for a very long time. And he starts to help break up your fellow ground. Okay. Uh, I gotta end. Uh, but I, uh, and I want to end <laughs> because I'm thirsty and lightly hungry and and, and I'm old, so this is bedtime. All the things. And it's time to end. Okay, listen, hold on. The thing that I would just love to do the most is, I, I don't know, of course, I don't know anybody's story here. You know, I know the Danix a little bit, but like, so I don't know why you came tonight or where you're at in your life. I just know this, that if you ever thought that God was harsh, oh, absolutely, you should fear him because he can wipe us out but there's a vine dresser. <laughs> Jesus actually showed up and walked in the dirt with us to go, hey, not yet. Let's see if they'll respond to my work. So Jesus cares about your life. Jesus wants to step in and partner with you in your life. It's kind of a trick deal because it sounds like a partnership. It's not. Jesus actually wants full rights, full control of everything in your life. And you have to be willing to call him king and let him call the shots. And you gotta, when he says, pull that up, you gotta pull that up out of your life. When you say that thing again, he's gonna say, don't you say that anymore. And you're gonna have to go, yes, Lord. And when you look at something and he goes, I don't want you to look at that anymore. You're gonna have to say, yes, Lord. When he says, I don't want you to spend any more money, give any more money to stuff that feeds into the devil's stuff. You're gonna have to say, yes, Lord, my money belongs to you. Every part of me belongs to you. And if you do that, the vine dresser will step in and make your life fruitful the way it was supposed to be. You have a way bigger farm, way bigger fields than you even knew. And so if you don't know Jesus as a savior and as king in your life, you've never made a commitment to him, I'm gonna pray with you right here on the spot. You get to stay in your seat, I get to stay up here. Everybody's eyes are gonna be closed, but I'm gonna ask you in just a second to raise your hand up and pray with me if that's you. And I believe that Jesus will step in and begin to make your life a little more like what it was supposed to be like. I'm gonna ask everybody to close your eyes right now. Every single person, I'm gonna keep my eyes open. Nobody's looking around. If you're not a Christ follower, but you wanna start that tonight with this prayer, I would love to pray with you. And so right now, just stick your hand straight up in the air. If you go, I, I'm not there and I need to start tonight. Come on, thank you. Hold it up high so I can see it, okay? I don't want, I want to make sure I'm praying for the right people. Praise the Lord. You can put hands down. We're going to pray together. And I want everybody in this building and everybody that's online, I guess we're watching online. I want everybody to just jump on in on this prayer. Pray this out loud with your words. Jesus, I'm coming to you with the hard places of my life. Can you all pray louder when we do this? And I'm asking you to step in and take control of my life. I give you permission. Thank you for caring about me. Thank you for seeing me. Thank you for forgiving me. You're the king in my life and I'm gonna follow you. It starts tonight, but it goes the rest of my life in Jesus' name.